It is a joy to be able to uh, worship with you today and uh, part of this experience for this week. So I begin by saying grace to you and peace in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. For the last several years, I have been engaged in my own form of spiritual formation and different spiritual practices, trying to strengthen my relationship with God and with others. Because of the opportunities where I uh, have to serve in ministry of different places around the world, I find myself upholding leaders and situations and needs literally from around the world with different colleagues with whom I serve and work, spending time in uh, scripture. I listen to a podcast every day called Pray As You Go, which is a 12 to 13 minute podcast put out by the Catholic Church in England on scripture and song and questions and I try to do all that to center myself. I also use the mission prayer every day and I have started now for the last couple of years to say the Lord's Prayer three times a day. Once I say it in a traditional way in which we would normally say it in our worship experiences. I listen to it in music uh, during the midday and right now I'm listening to the Ukraine National uh, orchestra and choir to sing the Lord's Prayer in Ukraine. And then in the evening, I say the Lord's Prayer in a more contemporary version. All of these are practices to try to get me to strengthen my relationship with God and with others. And I also do a hymn each day. I do the same hymn, and then as the focus of worship and liturgy changes, I change the hymn to go in alignment with whatever we might be doing, whether it's Lent or Easter or whatever. But now, for those of you who are aware, we're in what's called ordinary time. Uh, that does not mean boring time. Ordinary time in the life of the Christian world is that it is the time when we give focus to God's presence and movement in the ordinary, everyday occurrences of life. The times when we think God is not moving or paying attention are the times that we are paying to pay attention. And this is the hymn that I'm doing as part of my devotion now. Searcher of hearts to you are known. The inner secrets of my soul At home abroad in crowds alone You sense my yearning to behold Search me, O God, and know my heart Try me and all my heart survey. May I respond with days well lived. Lord, lead me in your lasting way. Amen. I invite you to join me in prayer. Spirit of the living God, you are already with us, but we ask that we might feel your presence with us now. Wherever we are, settle our minds and soften our hearts. If we are scared, bring us trust. If we are tired, give us rest. If we are angry, give us peace. If we are lonely, give us comfort. If we are inspired and able, give us courage to act. Though we, your people, are sometimes far apart, draw our hearts together to be the body of Christ the Church you call us to be. Amen. Someone dialed the wrong number and heard the following voicemail message on that other call, on that other line. I'm not available right now. But I thank you for caring enough to call. I'm making some changes in my life, 
So please leave me a message. If I do not return your call, you are one of those changes. <laughs> I wonder sometimes, to be honest with you, how many times has God been begging creation to make some changes, and we have chosen to ignore them? I was wrestling a little bit last night after Vicki and I had a conversation when she was asking me about the worship today and what I thought I was going to focus in on, and I thought I knew what I was going to be focusing in on in my scripture. But that question that she asked began this whole internal struggle of doubt of whether or not I was actually listening and whether or not God was saying, dude, I want you to make some changes. But as I went to bed and I wrestled with it a little bit and got up this morning and I wrestled with it a little more and I'm sitting over there wrestling with it a little more and then the skit began to unfold and I knew that the things with which I had been wrestling were the things that I needed to continue to wrestle with with you today. I'm going to use as part of my message today from the 29th chapter of the book of Jeremiah, beginning in verse 1 and then some selected verses. And hear these words from the prophet Jeremiah, and as you're hearing them, look at or think about and remember what was read in terms of the scripture from the Doctrine and Covenants, section 163, 3b. Just to remind you what those words are. Above all else, strive to be faithful to Christ's vision of the peaceable kingdom of God on earth. Courageously challenge cultural, political, and religious trends that are contrary to the reconciling and restoring purposes of God pursue peace. Hear those words of section 163 and listen to the prophetic voice of Jeremiah centuries ago. These are the words of the letter that the prophet Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to the remaining elders among the exile and to the priests, the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Skipping down to verse 4. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on his behalf. For in its welfare, you will find your welfare. And then jumping down to verse 10. <coughs> For thus says the Lord, only when Babylon's 70 years are completed, will I visit you and I will fulfill to you my promises and bring you back to this place. For surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for your welfare and not for your harm, to give you a future with hope. Then when you call upon me and come and pray to me, I will hear you. When you search for me, you will find me, if you will seek me with all your heart. I will let you find me, says the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, says the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. In this particular portion of this book of Jeremiah, the people are living in exile. We hear that over and over and over again. It's not what they wanted. It's not what they chose. They were forcibly taken from their home in Jerusalem into Babylon, and their lives would be forever changed. Sometimes life gives us what we neither wanted nor what we chose. I suspect that if we're going to be honest, 
Most of us in this room and those who might be watching in other means have experienced life in exile. Sometimes, but not always, exile is an external reality involving a geographical move. But it is also an inner condition that reveals our own alienation from ourselves, from one another, and from God. It's a type of homelessness that we're not quite sure how to address and make sense of. Because it's about a condition of our human heart, not just about a geographical location. You don't always have to leave home to be in exile. Jeremiah presided over one of the most tumultuous and great crises of the day of the people of God's covenant. The conquering of Jerusalem in, one, in 587 B.C. The Babylonian exile is just a historical event. It is also a description of our human heart. And I think in many ways especially in the Western world and in North America, we are experiencing exile. We didn't choose it, we don't want it, but it's where we are. Far too many of us experience living in community and in exile. We've lost our home, we're wandering in the wilderness of grief and anger. We're going to be present. Nothing changes. Gun violence, bullying, racism, discrimination, the well-being of children and families, just to mention a few, we continue to be in exile. You see, one of the risks of exile that goes unspoken is that in exile, we lose our humanity and do whatever we need to do to survive. I think that's what Jeremiah was addressing in the exiles in his letter that he shared from God. Now, Jeremiah is known as the weeping, wailing, whining prophet. Dude, let me tell you something. If you would have been in charge of things in his day, there would have been a whole lot of weeping and wailing on your part too. It's a bad rap for Jeremiah. He had to try and hold things together when nobody believed they should be together. But let me be clear about this. In spite of all that we see, in spite of all the despair experienced in far too many places in the world, the kingdom of God the neighborhood of God is not at risk. We are being invited every day in many ways to repent and believe in the good news that the neighborhood of God has come near. We go to Babylon in all kinds of ways. What's happening in far too many places is horrible. And some of you probably in this room have experienced that kind of exile and tragedy that we can't put words to even try to begin to understand or to fully explain. While it might be new in particular for some, it is just another expression of the estrangement that we feel. So how then are we supposed to live as exiles in the land? Listen to what Jeremiah says from God. Build houses, plant gardens, create new life, multiply and do not divide. What does that even look like or mean for us today? Jeremiah is not simply saying, bloom where you are planted. And he's not saying, when life gives you lemons, make lemonade. He's talking about how we keep and recover our humanity. And it begins with some self-reflection. What are we building and what are we planting today? What new life are we in the process of creating? What are we multiplying? The choices to be made, some are better than others. Some will bring light to the darkness 
and other choices will actually widen our estrangement. Don't just take these all too literally. Let them provoke your imagination. Let them begin to unpack for you the possibilities about what God might be doing to rekindle hope and offer a vision for the future. What if we were to build houses of mercy, compassion, justice, and peace? What if we planted gardens of forgiveness, reconciliation, and trust? What if we created a new life that welcomed and respected the dignity of every human being? What if we multiplied love, courage, and truth? Now this is not a to-do list for us to be able to earn brownie points to get into heaven. But these are supposed to be our daily practices, our way of being with and for one another. The way to our new homeland, as Jeremiah says from God. Building, planting, creating, multiplying our way home. All of this was God's vision then and has not changed. Vision is the ability to see God's presence and to perceive God's power to focus on God's plan in spite of the obstacles we might think are there. Vision is the ability to see above and beyond the majority. Vision is perception, reading the presence and power of God into our circumstances. Sometimes we can think of vision as looking at life through the lens of God's eyes, seeing situations as God sees them. But too often we see things as not as they are, but as we are. Vision has to do with looking at life with a divine perspective, reading the scene with God in clear focus, reading the scene as though God has pitched God's tent and moved into the neighborhood. Whoever wants to live differently in the system is going to have to correct his or her vision. And vision is about changing our expectations. We expect God to show up in a certain way, in a certain time, and do the thing that we want. And yet God's engagement with humanity is constantly saying to us, Don't tell me what to do. Change your expectations. Does anyone expect God to show up? What about a man who is so old and his wife is so old without children and being told they will have children and they will become the parents of many nations? For a group of slaves being ruled by Egyptian rulers or in a place beyond the edge of the wilderness, a bush on fire but is not consumed, at the edge of the sea with armies on the move, does anyone expect God to show up in an unwed teen in Bethlehem? In a guy who lives in the desert, and when he preaches, he makes people cranky. <laughs> Deacons? In a guy who is the chief prosecutor of anyone who says they're followers of the way. In a teenage boy who has the audacity to pray in a grove. Lord, what do you want me to do? Today, we are the stewards of the vision of a God who shows up even when we aren't expecting it. God In your life, God in your neighborhood, in any of these examples, and in so many others that aren't captured in the biblical text, but in just the ordinary expressions of our everyday life, God says to us every single day, I am who I am, I will be who I will be. Change your expectations of me and start living into the expectations I have for you. Even if we say we are ready to change, we must be prepared for the whole truth of what that means. 
We have to right here and right now be willing to let go of things that we like, our own personal preferences, to invite others to influence our work, our worship, and our time together. I believe that in this passage from Jeremiah and what we hear from section 163 is just another way of helping us understand that life has changed, not ended. It's about finding what faith, hope, and love look like in the land, in the place, at this time. Build, plant, marry, multiply, seek, pray, and do not decrease. We have to be able to have the courage to abandon right now our viewpoint that this is all about us and what we can do for community and allow God to create the new expectations of a new emerging community even within this space. One that is for all people. A place where we worship but we do not claim the power for ourselves. We must believe that we are part of a larger community, unique and important, but part of a larger mosaic that is made up of many cultures, many personalities, and many personalities. But I must be clear about this. My faith is in Jesus Christ and not the church. But I choose to live out my discipleship in community of Christ and continue to be challenged by the vision that Christ puts within me that disruption of God's spirit of asking Larry is that your expectation or is that your understanding of what I am calling you to be about I love community of Christ it frustrates the heck out of me a lot of times because I'd rather deal with sinners than believers all the time but that's what we have. <laughs> but folks, I do not worship the church. I worship the one who put everything into the beginning. And when I set myself free in, in order to be able to follow where God is going, I recognize I give the body of Christ a much wider place of grace because I too am part of that larger body of Christ. I choose to live out my discipleship in this community, but my faith is in Jesus Christ. And it is in his vision that I try to live my life and I make a mistake every single day. Many times in my travels, especially in the United States, I am asked this question, where are we headed? They're asking about the future of Community of Christ. I'm not totally clear, and anyone that tells you they have it all figured out, that is, that is just a bunch of horse pucky. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody knows. But I do believe God is calling us to return to our roots. And at the heart of our roots, it's not about having the answers, but the courage to ask the questions. What does this mean? Returning to our roots calls us back to the book of Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2, verses 42 to 46. It was in that portion of Scripture that the founder of this movement was inspired with other leaders to begin to envision what would it look like for us to have the neighborhood of God on earth right here and now. Not some other day, not for some other people, but right here and right now. And I believe that God is calling Community of Christ to return to our roots of fellowship, of generosity, of community, of learning to live together, and above all else, reflect the body of Christ in a way that says to every single person, you belong. 
while everybody else wants to get rid of people, we must have the courage to stand up and say, the neighborhood of God is present here. You belong. For surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans for your welfare and not for harm. To give you a future with hope. I can't tell you what today what the future looks like, but I do trust it's there. I can't tell you today when the future will arrive, but I trust that it comes. I can't tell you today how the future will happen, but I trust that when it does, God's neighborhood.